Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program who include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Dr. Serge Gauthier, Professor Emeritus, formerly of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors. Today's topic is a wife's journey of love, devotion, and caregiving challenges. My guest today will speak about her journey as a caregiver to her husband and the ripple effect that it had on her own mental health. She will share what she has learned about the plight of seniors in hospitals and long-term care facilities and other important lessons from her hands-on experience with dementia care. My guest is Linda Grossman. Linda graduated from the University of Toronto in 1961 as a registered dental hygienist. She's the author of six children's books that she wrote for the Toronto Child Abuse Centre. She became a passionate advocate for people living with dementia while caring for her husband. She serves on several boards and councils related to aging, including the Canadian Consortium of Neurodege Neurodegeneration and Aging, uh, Aging's Engagement of People with Lived Experience of Dementia. Welcome to McGill Cares, Linda. Thank you very much, Claire. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak about this subject, which is very near and dear to my heart. And just as a little correction, um, my husband's name uh, was Samuel William Grossman, but it's a long, long story. <laughs> we called him Mickey. We always <laughs> called him Mickey, so that's who uh -huh. he was. Well, thank you for being here. I have to say, um, you know, I give a lot of talks and oftentimes at the end of my talk, people come to me and tell me that, Claire, your story is my story. Um, and that's basically what happened to me when I heard you speak, uh, I, think, I believe it was in February and you were speaking at a conference virtually. And I was just mesmerized to the screen because it was the first time that I personally had ever heard the testimonial of somebody whose story was really my story. I mean, in our cases, you were the wife and I was the daughter, but every part of your journey mimicked mine. And I said, I need to meet this woman. So you and I are meeting for the first time today. Nice to meet with you. So let's begin. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about Mickey. Who was Mickey? Who, you know, tell us about your husband and, you know, be before dementia. He, not just because he was my husband, but he was an extremely bright individual. He um, went through dental school at the University of Toronto at the time when um, only 20% of our religion was accepted into University of Toronto. And he passed that and he did very well. And in his final year, there, there was always a program called Dentantics. And he wrote Dentantics, and he wrote the music and directed it. So that tells you a little bit about him. He was very bright and a far more patient individual than I ever was and uh, or am. And it was a very difficult thing for me to accept. And I don't think I really have accepted even yet all of the trauma that went along with his diagnosis of dementia. You know, I, I, and I have a lot of notes in front of me, but, you know, I think today, what, you know, the purpose of what we want to talk about is you said, this was in your speech and I'm quoting you, you know, when I, when I'm finished speaking, perhaps you will understand that in real life, the smiling pictures of well-groomed, seemingly happy people that we so often observe in folders, advertisements and on the internet, portraying individuals suffering from different aspects of dementia accompanied there by their caregivers are a myth, right? And so we're here to really talk about, you know, like I said, you and I have a similar story, but we're here to really talk about what happened, right? So um, first of all, how old was he when he first started showing symptoms? And I know that it was really your kids who started bringing to your attention that things were off, right? Yes, yeah. Um, he was about 65. Oh, young. He was yeah. young. But he was about 65, but we really didn't notice it. We didn't notice it till 
he was he was able to disguise it. And uh, as time went along, when he was um, 70, we knew that th something was they knew my kids knew uh they kept saying to me you know something's the matter with dad and i kept saying to them you know we're getting older and we can't do everything the way we did before but his habits um and the way he talked was different than what it used to be so give us some examples because you know i i often say like people think dementia is all about memory but i know in my mother's case like in, in mickey's case it was started with changes in behavior or words right like what happened with mickey well yes it was changes in in memory too uh we had a dog we have a daughter who at that time lived in uh, ottawa and he used to drive her when she came to visit us he used to drive her to the island airport uh, to take the plane back to Ottawa. And he knew the way very, very well. And uh, then when he would take her, he would get lost for a short while. And he would say, uh, I guess they've closed some of the streets off. It just didn't make sense. But it was, it was very, very difficult um, to understand this, he was a very good speech maker. Um, when Mickey was young, and I'm just giving you some examples, um, he had, after he started to work, he bought an MG. And uh, when our, our daughter uh, was married, his speech to our son-in-law was, I'm giving you one of uh, your very own MG. And he said, one of Mickey's girls. This is the kind of person he was. There were so many stories I could tell you uh, about this. He just was very clever about this. And, and you could see that this was disappearing. Um, I, I was having surgery at one point. And um, when, before we got to the, to the hospital, he knew that we had to be there at a certain time and he took his time over breakfast and we were all anxious to get going. This just time meant a lot to him. And all of a sudden this disappeared. And mm -hmm. when we, we, when I was admitted for the surgery, he began to ask the surgeon different questions that he never would have asked. It just, it was indicating that the surgeon didn't really know what he was talking about. I mean, this was, mm -hmm. this was not mm -hmm. Mickey, not the way he behaved. So, so what was, what, what, what was like the tipping point where you realized, okay, I really need to take him to see a doctor. Like he needs to be seen. What, what was that? Was it your kids that just kept telling you, mom, he's got to be seen or like what happened? Yes, yes, that's what happened. The kids really got at me. And although uh, I wouldn't admit there was something wrong, I thought to myself, okay, I do notice there's something and the kids are at me all the time. And naively, very naively, I thought if we go to a physician, maybe he can give us some medication, maybe he can give Mickey some medication um, so that this will, his memory will improve. And instead of being honest with him, I mean, we had a very close relationship. We, we were together 24 hours a day, seven days a week because we worked together. Um, and I didn't want to tell him that there seemed to be something wrong. So instead, and I'm telling you this now, and I have not admitted this very often, I, I tricked him. I mm -hmm. tricked him into going to see the physician and I chose the best known um, physician uh, in Toronto at that time in this field. And I said to Mickey, you know, um, our, our memory, including me, seems not to be what it is, what it was before. So why don't we go to a physician and see if they can help us with some medication? Uh, and when we, I didn't say to him that maybe there was something more serious. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't say it to him. 
But, you know, I read that in your in your testimonial about using the word trick. But I have to say, Linda, you were actually very, you know, you were very actually forward and wise about what you did, because unfortunately, dementia causes another condition called anosognosia, which makes it so that the person that has dementia most of the time doesn't recognize that there's anything wrong with themselves. Nobody, I mean, I would say 85% at least of the people, and especially the families that I work, including my mother, were saying, why would I need to see a doctor? There's nothing wrong with me, right? But, but they have to be seen. So it's interesting even that you say that because when we went to the physician and he was given the test and he scored in the high 90s in the MMSC test, and um, at the end of the uh, appointment, the physician said to him, you have uh, the beginnings of mild cognitive impairment, and I am re removing your right to drive. Oh, he said that. And he said, he said several things and not really giving Mickey. It was like he, he, Mickey was a thing, not mm -hmm. a person. And mm -hmm. um, he gave all of the instructions that he that he was going to give about what was what was coming and what should be done. And he said, and on the way out, see my social worker. And Mickey turned to him and said to him, this is the first time you have ever met me. How do you know what I was like before if you didn't know me before. How do you know I wasn't like this all of the time, all, all the time? And the physicians very coldly, very coldly said to him, because this is my job. I see this every day. And I know that this is what you have. It was cruel, really. Mm -hmm. And on the way out, um, he said to Mick, to me, and Mickey didn't hear him, uh, with luck, your husband will die of something else before he morphs into Alzheimer's. Can you imagine how I felt? Yes, because that's what I was, I think, yelling at the screen when I was watching you speak, because that was my experience with my mother. It was exactly like that. It was basically you know, good luck, Mrs. Webster. My mother was furious without any warning. He took away her driver's license. Like when you're talking about, you know, leaving the, uh, leaving the doctor's office and the anger and fury and, you know, the shock and no information, no education. And, you know, you know, at one point we were exchanging emails and you said, I'm going to interview you, Claire, but I, I want you to know, Linda, that I decided to become a caregiver crusader, okay, or doing the work that I do because of that moment in the doctor's office, because of the lack of compassion, the lack of education, because I feel that if that whole experience would have been different, my journey with my mother would have been different, right? But even, even carrying it further, I was so shocked at the diagnosis. And quite frankly, I had no idea what MCI was. Mm -hmm. And he took away his license right that day, and I drove home. And a few weeks afterwards, um, we made an appointment for him to retry his driver's uh, test. And I went with him, and he drove. And the examiner said at the end, um, I don't know why you've come here. You've wasted my time. And I, listening to those words, I was devastated. And then he said, you are a better driver than most of the people that come here. And here's your license back. So I thought to myself, this man does not know what he's talking about. Like the physician doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and Mickey was right. He had never seen him before. He didn't know what he was like before. I mean, here was a man who in his youth um, went to New York with a friend of his who was in medicine. And the two of them drove the wrong way down a one-way street in New York. And Mickey was the person who told the driver how to go. So this was the way he was. Mm -hmm. And how, how could the physician say this so dictatorially and without feeling, without 
understanding, without compassion. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you treat someone? Is that Mm -hmm. if you were to uh, tell a a patient um, that came in to see you, if you were a cancer specialist, you have cancer, there's nothing we can do about it, go home and die. You know that Mm -hmm. that's not the way it's done today. So why is it okay? And here's where I'm interviewing you. Why is it okay for the physicians to talk this way? Why are they not better educated Mm -hmm. in how to deal with this enormous diagnosis? Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll tell you when we, McGill was responsible for writing the 2021 World Alzheimer's Report on the journey of diagnosis of dementia. And we're now working on the 22 report, which is the post-diagnosis. And we conducted a world survey of care partners from from around the world. And we asked them what the biggest challenge was for them upon receiving a diagnosis of their loved one. And the world response was lack of information and education about this illness, okay? So this is not a provincial problem or or a national problem, we live in Canada. This is a global problem. And what we've come to realize is that it begins at the medical school. It begins, that a, a lot of times we see that the students are learning about the illness, okay? Here's the illness and here are the medications that may or may not work, right? But what they're not learning about is that how do you talk to patients? What is the post-diagnosis process, especially for dementia, okay? And what we've also come to realize is that, you know, because there is no cure right now, like pharma- pharmacological cure, it's like, Well, you know, good luck. So that's where we're trying, at least at McGill, we're trying to instill change. We want to ensure, I mean, I'm lecturing now to the medical students about if you don't provide a family member with the proper information, education, support, look what happens to them. Look what happens to the quality of care that they can may or may not provide to their loved one, right? So where is the problem? It begins at the at the school level, Linda. Okay, and that's what we're advocating for. Okay. So I wanna I wanna I wanna continue with you because of you. Know, I wanna make sure we have enough time to cover everything. I just so to, just yeah, for, go ahead. Um, I am on uh, the geriatric committee of a hospital here, Sunnybrook Hospital, and the head of that committee I have a great deal of respect for. I've just been in touch with her last week. I don't know what it's like at McGill, but at U of T. In four years of medical training, they are now fighting, this this physician is now fighting to have two weeks training on dementia. Why? They've known about dementia for a long time. University of Toronto Medical School is a very good medical school. Why are they not understanding the need for things like that? Why aren't they allowing me, as you are, to come and make them aware of the situation, of what mm-hmm. we're going to, going through? What can I do to make them realize that two weeks is a joke when mm-hmm. you're talking about this diagnosis? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I think I think we're going to hopefully provide the template for many universities around the world. So they could they they're all welcome to come and talk to me. All right, Linda, I want to because I want to move on because I want to make sure we have enough time for your for your interview. So you um so you, so now you've received this diagnosis. You were talking about how your mind is swirling, right? And it's interesting because. All of a sudden you're talking about, oh my goodness, you know, your husband was the one managing the finances. What are the legal implications? And it's interesting how for so many families, the topic of finances becomes a humongous stress, right? So can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, it's hard for me to tell you that because we went through all our married life. Uh, I had my own bank account, but, um, and I looked after my own things, but he looked after the the house situations and taxes and so on. I didn't even know who to go to in those days. And, and mm-hmm. you've got to remember, I'm quite a bit more senior. Women didn't look after those type of things. And he wasn't ready to give this um 
job up to me? How could I, who did I speak to? Where did I go? The doctor didn't tell me when I was at, at the hospital having this interview, he didn't tell me, look, there are lots of things that you're going to have to look after. Finances, do you understand about them? Do you have a will? What does your will say? Do you have a power of eternity? eternity? What is that, right? Like, what is it? How do we even get one, right? Like, what is that, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think had those things been handled better, um, maybe I wouldn't have been so desperate as I was. And I, I did, fortunately, fortunately for me, I had a brother-in-law who was an accountant who came to my assistance. But what about if you're new in this country? What about if you have come here and you don't speak the language very well? Um, who do you apply to then? Mm -hmm. Who's going to help you with these things? Mm -hmm. Even now, I can't give you an answer for it. So I'd like to start talking about your unraveling because I, you know, I, my kids, my kids were young when I was, when I got into the journey, my kids were two, four and nine years old. And, you know, and we, I would often say how I was witnessing the unraveling of my mother while my children started to witness my own unraveling. And you, you said that you were suffering from acute caregiver's disease. I call it kind of post-traumatic caregiver disorder. That's my term for it. Talk to us about what led to that. You know, you're taught, you were saying about all the responsibilities that you took on and caring for your husband. Can you just bring us through that, that the journey? What were the, what were the tasks that you had to take on and what led to that, to you getting so overwhelmed? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, an example. Um, I, I was, when I was younger, a stubborn person. I'm not anymore, but I was when I was younger, but uh, I am a very stubborn individual. And I, I didn't want to listen to anybody. And my own family physician suggested that I take a course at Mount Sinai about, mm -hmm. about this. And he uh, put forth my name and I, I went. And Mickey was supposed to go too. It was divided in two. And um, he wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. And no matter how, by this time, I realized that we had problems. And I began taking him to different courses that were suggested for him. And he, he didn't want to go. And he said to me uh, at one time, when we went to one of these courses, I never would have done this to you. Why are you doing it to me? So when I took this course at Mount Sinai, that was led by a very well known group, they listened, there were 10 of us, and they listened to what happened to us during the week. And then we did role playing, how we could have handled the situation better. And I'd like to say to you that for me, and I don't know if it's for everybody, life like this is not a play. It's not an act. And even though they tell you how to handle things, when you're in the thick of it, you forget about all of these nice suggestions that these people have made. And I'll give you an example. We were going out for dinner one night and Mickey was in the washroom and he was in there for a long time. And I went in and he was shaving. He had shaving cream all over his face and he was removing the shaving cream to remove the, the beard with his toothbrush. Can you tell me how to act when you find something like this? Or another example was, uh, again, we were going out for dinner and by this time, I realized I had to pick all his clothes for him. And I did. I put out everything on the bed for him to put on. And he was very, very meticulous. His brown socks and his gray socks and his blue socks were all separated in the drawer. And I never did it. He did it. And that particular time I said to him, I've put out your clothes, but I've forgotten your socks. Can you please get a pair of brown socks out of the drawer? And he went to the drawer and he began 
emptying all the socks onto the floor. And I screamed, what are you doing? Who do you think is going to pick those up? And he looked at me like I was from another world. He had no idea what he was doing wrong. Explain to me how these courses that you take can help you in that moment when they said to me, you should have said, okay, sweetheart, um, don't worry, I'll get the socks for you. I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to pick up the socks from the floor. I was I, what, what I appreciate also when you, you know when you talk and that's what I talk a lot about was my anger right like how angry this disease made you how angry this made you right and not only the fact that here's this wonderful man that contributed to society how this disease impacted him but how the disease impacted you that you just you didn't have a life anymore right so can you talk about that anger like because a lot of people don't want to admit they feel shame in, a, in, a, in, in admitting their anger. But there's no shame in admitting anger. How can I explain to you my anger that came instantly? Because this was not the type of man that I knew. I don't know. And I'm just going to give you another example. And I hope you will uh, take time to understand this. I don't know if you know the name Lisa Rate. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Lisa Raitt was in, in, I believe, the conservative government, and she was just interviewed um, uh, by Sandy Rinaldo of CTV mm -hmm. here in Toronto. And something happened to her uh, that happened to me. Um, Mickey fell, and by the, uh, he fell in, in our condo here, and I couldn't lift him up. And by that time, I had um, help. In, in the house that I had hired and paid for myself. And we couldn't lift him up. He was a big man and he'd fallen and it was awkward. So we called 911 and they came and he had cut his head falling. And by the time he came, they came, he was okay. He hadn't knocked himself out or anything. And they began to ask him questions. And they said to him, uh, and who is this lady? And he didn't say, that's Linda. He said, that's my wife. And he, they asked him various questions like that. And um, I said, I wanted him to go to the hospital for this gash. And they said they wouldn't take him because he was okay. And I said, he's got Alzheimer's. He needs to go. And they said to me, the only way we can take him is if we call the police, have him charged and bring him to the hospital. And that was exactly what Lisa Rate said with her interview with Sandy Ronaldo. I did not allow that. I asked them to lift him up and we got him to the car and I took him to the hospital. Lisa Raitt had the police put handcuffs oh my on goodness. Is, is having the disease of Alzheimer's making you a, a person? Criminal. A criminal? Is that? And when I say to you, this is not something new. This no. is not. Why do our um, 911 operators not understand that there's another way of teaching, the, of doing this? And I was so frustrated and angry about this that I, I called 911 and I kept moving up to speak to someone in charge. And finally, I got them to agree to have someone from Alzheimer's Toronto give this particular department lessons. Why do I have to do that? Why do they, to today, if Lisa Wright, Wright just gave this interview, why are people with dementia in some cases, I'm not saying every case, but why are they treated as criminals? Did they deserve that? Do I deserve that? Why shouldn't I get angry? But who, to whom shall I express my anger? Who's going to listen to me? Mm -hmm. 
Linda, tell us now. So as as um, Mickey's condition kept evolving, where 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 did he receive care? I know that you have some experience with the long term care in hospitals, as so do I. So where where was he in uh, until the end? Was he in a long term care? Was it a public long term care? Was it a private? Where did he go? Um, when I could no longer handle the situation and uh financially i was very strapped because mm -hmm. uh there was no money given to me by the government for for this type of care and yes you you get a tax deduction but the tax which is minimal which is minimal doesn't even cover two months of care and my kids said to me as they watched me uh, going deeper and deeper into depression, they were, they sat down with me and they were very clear. They said, one of you is going to die. If it's you that dies first, we want you to know that the next day we will be placing dad in a long-term care facility. And when they talked that way, I realized that I was at the end of my rope. I was at the, the end of my rope physically, mentally, every way that you can think of. And if you think for one minute that I didn't consider suicide, you'd be quite wrong. Because I, and I'm, I'm not that, that was never something that was in my mindset. But I felt that if that, if I should decide on that, Mickey would be someone else's problem, not mine. So when the kids talked to me that way, I interviewed 12, 12 long-term care facilities in Toronto. And I wish I had the opportunity to take you to some of these facilities. I don't know if, if you understand the term snake pit. There was a, an actress, Susan Hayward, and she was in one of these long-term care facilities, but many of them are like that. And I could not, in all consideration, place them in any of these places. And finally, I found one that was a private one. And uh, at that time, at that time, it was more than $7,000 a month at that time. And I borrowed money so I could place them there. I interviewed them three times, three times. And Mickey was the kind of person who loved the outdoors. And I said that to the marketing manager. I said, you know, my husband loves the outdoors. What, what can you do to make sure that in the nice weather, he will be outside? And she said to me, don't worry, Linda. We have one-on-one -on -one PSWs here. And in the nice weather, two PSWs will take him to the park every day. The only thing she didn't tell me was there was no park nearby. Mm. The questions, I can go on and on. Um, Friday nights, they had special dinners. And Mickey was always an immaculate, very well-dressed individual. And I said to her, uh, what type of clothing should I bring for him? And she says, well, he can, during the day, he can wear jeans and, you know, a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. But Fridays, he should have better clothes to wear for our dinner Friday nights. And the only thing she didn't tell me was there was no one to change him before his dinner. And the slobber that was on his shirt remained there. The, the inconsistencies that are going on in the long-term care facilities, at least here in Toronto, are devastating, disgusting, and completely demoralizing. And that was where I placed Mickey. I went every single day and I, I went around two o'clock in the afternoon and stayed until he went to, to bed at night and fed him dinner. And COVID came and they were so unprepared for COVID. And here is a place that's a private 
organization who's taking this kind of money that is now taking more than $10,000 a month. And the owner asked the, the families if they would be kind enough to contribute so the PSWs didn't have to take uh, the subway to work and they could be taking taxis. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Linda, I mean, I'm sure you heard the horror stories that came out of Quebec as well. So the story, so so what is going on in Ontario is not only immune to Ontario. You heard about the stories that are going on in Quebec. Now, so M- Mickey passed away. You mentioned a year and a half ago. Yes. Was there and 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 since then, or was it even before? You be how you've become this incredible advocate, talking about the importance of the lack of dementia care education. What what made you do that? I mean, I, I told you a bit before about it was my anger that propelled me to do the work that I'm doing, right? And my own experience is, you know, you say at the end of your of your, of your testimonial that, you know, you, you wish you would have made other decisions. You know, you wish you would have been d- doing a better job, but I think you did the best that you can. Um, I think the gift, I think the gift of unfortunately the gift I always say the gift of my mother's illness is now my ability to help others and I and I feel that about you um Claire I I do want to clarify one thing with you I was so distraught at the treatment Mickey received in this long-term care facility that I brought him home by ambulance three days before he died and um you say that I shouldn't feel guilty I'm not really sure how to get rid of this guilt because from seeing what went on with him, there's not a chance that I would want for my life, should that happen to me, Mm -hmm. um, to be treated the way Mickey was. And the only reason I can, no matter what I do, I can't bring Mickey back. I understand that. I understand that very well. But I feel that there are many more Mickeys around. And I feel if I can make a little bit of difference for the people who have come after him, then I will be doing honor to his life. But I say to you that you're right. Since he was diagnosed, I have been a public speaker about this. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've spoken, I've spoken at government round tape. I'm not going to go into it many Mm -hmm. times. And people pat me on the back and say, you've done a good job. You're doing a good job. But in reality, and I think that if you will examine what you're doing, in reality, people may be listening to you, but 90% of them do not hear you. And what is happening today is when you look at illnesses, and I'm, for example, I'll say cancer, um, the research that is done on cancer is tremendous, as so it should be. But children, maybe one year old, maybe less, can develop cancer. Young people nine and 10 do not develop dementia. Why are we not putting more emphasis on the diagnosis, on the understanding, on the research of cancer, of, of, of Alzheimer's? Why are we saying in effect, you have lived most of your life, you have contributed to society, So there's nothing much more that we can do. What I think, and I'm being very honest with you, is by the way that it's being handled today, even with your efforts, even with my efforts, there's a cancer on society by not accepting that this is an extremely important situation. Yesterday, it was Mickey. I don't know, maybe tomorrow it'll be me. Maybe, I hope not, next month or next year, it's going to be you. What difference in the treatment 
that you will get if it's you or me next year? How much different than what your mother had? Answer that honestly. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I totally, I mean, I, I, I read about like, are the governments listening? And I feel truly, even if I can make the smallest bit of change, I, I feel grateful that a university that of which I did not attend listened to me. I knocked on the dean's door and I said, I want to make a change. I want to come and talk to the students here at McGill about the importance of educating the caregivers. I'm somebody with lived experience. The fact that one university out of the world <laughs> listened to me and that I'm welcome in the classrooms of this university and talking to different groups of students and they're supporting me in this program, a person that has no medical background, you know, just a lived experience and a lot of passion for this. I feel that if there were other universities doing this, and again, like I said at the beginning of this, of this webcast, making a, a significant change in the classroom, the way that the students are being taught, the way that even offering and continuing education, right? If we can make one small movement, but I believe that you know, it's not just for McGill. It's like, McGill, we're doing this, but let's share what we've done here with University of Toronto and let's share it with the world. Just, just if everybody can just do it, right? Um, I just I, I, are, one other thing, if I can. You've brought out a, up an extremely good point that the students must learn. Why are we waiting to get to university for the students to learn. Why, are, I'm working on this now, I am working with, with someone in Montreal on this. Uh, why are we not teaching the students in grade seven and in grade eight about dementia? So that they know that this is a very, very serious problem. So that they go home and ask their parents, Someone came to our class today and told us this story about dementia. Mom, dad, what would you want me to do if this happened to you? Explain to me, even though I'm only 10 or 11 or 12, make me understand what dementia is. Why are we not having this in the schools? Why will the University of Toronto not allow me to come and say the things I'm saying to you. What do I have to do? Be realistic. Mm -hmm. My time left is limited. You tell me what I should be doing so that not only are people listening to me, but they hear me and begin to make change. I don't see the change. So Linda, as one of my last questions, okay, a lot of people watching today are maybe just starting the, the, the journey with their husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, okay? What piece of advice or pieces of advice would you tell them, okay? When they're in that doctor's office now, okay? What would you say to them? That is a very good question. I think that I would probably say to the physician, you've given me this diagnosis at this point. I want to meet with you and my family next week and the week after that. And I want to discuss all of the things that you know are going ahead with this diagnosis. And I want you to give me written information of how I can improve the situation so my loved one doesn't go through the experiences that I've gone through. I think that I would demand this from the medical profession. And as I said to you in the beginning, I am a negative in, in individual. I don't think that the medical people in our city would do this for me. And even going to the Alzheimer Society and going to the Lins, as we discussed before, I don't think that we have achieved a proper way of handling this very, very serious situation. Here in my husband's case was a man who 
gave to society. And when he was diagnosed, from the second he was diagnosed, he was put placed on, on a back burner in a parking lot waiting to die. I, I only feel that this can be improved if we can get to those students in grade seven and eight, if we can get to the medical students and make those people who are designing the program for the medical students understand that two weeks is a joke. And the reason they're only offering two weeks, again, in my opinion, is because they don't understand the devastation that this all leads to. Linda, I cannot, cannot thank you enough for this probably most profound, um, probably one of the most important webcasts that I've done since McGill Care started. I'm extremely grateful for you to be here with me today. And just so, so that everybody knows who's watching today, Linda's full testimonial will be included in the 2022 World Alzheimer's Report on Post-Diagnostic Management and Care. So you could read about it. The World Report will be launched on September 21st. We will have a lot of promotion about it. It will be also available on the McGill website for you to read Linda's full story. Linda, thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you, Claire, for having me, for putting up with me, for listening to me. But Claire, I am practically begging you to help me find a way that we can move ahead so that dementia is as important as the word cancer. I promise that, Linda. I really promise. This webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list to be notified about upcoming episodes of McGill Cares or about other important programs and resources that we are offering, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching.